Uh, very welcome to the Centre for Complex System Studies. Um, so just to introduce Jean, uh, her background is in physics. Uh, she did her master in Oxford and PhD in Cambridge. She's the managing director of Claremont uh, Management Consultants, where she helps companies like Unilever and Oxfam do things like leadership, organization, organizational design. Uh, she's also a visiting fellow at Cranfield uh, School of Management at uh, the University of Bath and Bristol. Um, very, very interesting stuff. Um, she's very familiar with Amy here, who's um, very uh, active in the centre as well. Um, a little bit about Jean's personal life. She also did uh, work as a town councillor, so she's active in politics. Uh, she's uh, the lead author of Embracing Complexity, um, a book which she'll, uh, I'm sure, talk a little bit about further. And she also uh, underpins a lot of the work that she does with complexity, as well as Buddhist philosophy, which I'd be more interested in discussing afterwards. So without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Jean. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, <coughs> nice to be here and, uh, and, and lovely to be uh, invited. Um, so I want to um, talk a little bit, uh, add a little bit to where, where I'm coming from for, from this, and, um, and this has been passing around um, this, this book, Embracing Complexity, which I've was uh, wrote with Peter Allen, who I'll also uh, talk about, and, and Cliff Bowman. So I am, as you said, originally um, a theoretical physicist, uh, but I moved uh, away from that, um, did, did a mathematical modelling of, of quantum transport in semiconductors a long time ago, um, and they gave me a PhD anyway, so that was good. And um, uh, I, uh, I, I came across complexity thinking in the 1990s, so a long time ago, and it was a real um, passion for me since then. I was working in a business school, I was helping organisations with strategy and organisation, and this was a real marriage in, in a way of, of the kind of, um, you know, the, the addling of your brain you get from quantum physics, um, and, you know, the, the, the whole series of issues about uh, what do we do with a world that isn't entirely predictable, measurable, controllable, you know, what, what does all that mean, how do you operate? So, um, as, as I'll explain, I'm going to really be talking today about how I use those ideas um, in, um, with managers, you know, with leaders in organisations, both in international development and the public and the private sector, um, rather than um, say very much uh, to people like you about the ideas themselves, but uh, so I'm going to that's where I'm heading today. It's the kind of, so what do you do differently um, is, is the question that I'm trying to show you how I work with organisations. So does that sound okay so far? And um, I don't mind the old question, but, but um, I, it, it's pro you probably will do better to, to let me go through the, the main part of it and then ask questions, because um, otherwise I'll talk for hours. You know, you're getting the 40-minute version of a three-day version, so uh, you know, just warning, I can, um, I'm good at talking. So, um, so I, the, the, the issue that's really uh, struck me uh, a few years ago is that, that, that in the end, or, or the, the issue is one of world view. There's, there's something about what you believe the world is really like. Um, I was having a conversation in uh, Cranfield Business School last week. I was teaching um, in strategy, to MBAs in strategy there. And somebody was saying, but surely, Jean, if you have all the information, you know, then you can predict the future. Surely it's a question of, of, of it's too complicated, as opposed to there's something intrinsic about complexity. So there's, there's, there's something about, do we, do we carry around with us in the world the idea that, that if we can just do a good enough job of, of modelling, then, then we'll have the answer, because there is an answer, is, is a kind of issue, really. Uh, and what you'll hear me say, and I'll, I'll say it uh, right at the beginning, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that modelling doesn't have, have a role, but there's something about how you use models and what your world view is in, in using those. Do you think you're getting the answer, or do you think you're illuminating a, a complex problem um, that, that couldn't be thought through? So I'm, I'm interested in, in this idea of, of world views. What has become, in, for non-scientists, how do non-scientists think about the way the world works? Um, how, how has that got um, uh, uh, taken over into um, the, the world of social science um, by economists and, <coughs> and, and social scientists and management? So there's something about a difference. I want you to hear me talking differently about 
what we as scientists might think of science is and how the power science has in the world as a kind of understanding of the way the world works. So I'm, I'm differentiating those. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I talk about those things with non-scientists. Um, and then I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, give you a, quite fast, a number of approaches and examples that I use uh, about the kind of so what because um, what, what can happen in this dialogue with managers is you finally get to the point of going, oh my God, you know, she's <coughs> right, you know, the world is complex, you know, it is more difficult to do things. Um, and then the issue is, well, so what do we do differently? And um, that's, that's a more complex uh, answer, obviously. So I start with this idea of, of scientific worldviews. And... Um, I'm, I'm talking to managers about this, this idea of closed systems and the, the whole power that, that, that happened in the 17th century when, when first of all, Newton um, discovered uh, this, this, this very simple theory about, about the way that the, the, the planets go around each other. And, um, you know, it's interesting to non-scientists to know that, that Newton was really only dealing with two problems. You know, he was dealing with, in a sense, the, the relationship with, between two planets or between two billion balls. It, it was, um, you know, it wasn't a theory of everything. And, um, but it, it had a huge power. It was, it was translated uh, from uh, Latin to French by the Marquise de Châtelet, um, who was Voltaire's lover. And, um, and she and Voltaire worked together to think about, well, well what, what could this mean for, for a new way of, of kind of designing the world, of controlling the world? So it, it had a huge power. And it, and it also came at the, the time of, of huge upheaval in Europe, uh, religious wars, the, the Thirty Years' War, a, a, lot of, a lot of kind of chaos and uncertainty. So there was, a, there was a kind of opening for something that kind of said, well, actually, you know, look, you know, there's something very simple here which, which, which points to uh, control. And uh, uh, Descartes, uh, at the same time, um, and, and it's, it's kind of really interesting, which is, I, you know, I, I will curtail this, this conversation, but Descartes brought in the idea that uh, we can use reason, that reason will give us the answer, because God wouldn't have given us reason um, if it wasn't the right tool to use for getting the answer. So both of them, in, in a sense, um, had, had God in the picture. <coughs> God gave us reason. And there was a lot of, of discourse at the time with, with Newton, and one of his students was, was um, there's, a, there's letters with his relationship with um, Leibniz. And Leibniz was challenging Newton about, well, you know, your theory says nothing about the particularity of the universe. You know, why is the solar system here? you know, rather than there. What happens if the universe was set off half an hour later? Would it be different? And, and Newton's answer to these kind of axiomatic questions was, well, God decides. God decides when the universe is set off. Um, and apparently, according to one uh, friend of mine, mathematical physicist, I've never managed to find this myself, but uh, apparently in the queries to the optics, there was one question, which is, why is the solar system flat? To which Newton answered, because God periodically packs it back into place. <laughs> Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that, that for non-scientists, this is science. This is this is perfection. This means we can know everything. Um, it it kind of it, it conveys the image that to be scientific and professional is to, in a sense, treat problems like machines, as if, as if they uh, we we know how the bits connect. Uh, we know what the future is. So it's a very powerful. Um, uh, theory that, 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 was, that was taken over into the social and natural world. And nobody really, even, I don't remember at, at university, being, being having discussions about the philosophy of science and, and kind of the, the, the kind of the unspoken axioms that underpin these ideas and, and how, in, in some sense, this was Newton and Descartes being religious in, in trying to kind of explain how God worked. So those, those are kind of interesting kind of nuances around this. So, so we have this machine view, which of course tells us, you know, that things can be optimised, that is a right answer, uh, there is a path, if only we can find it, we can reduce things into parts. Um, and of course what, what isn't always said is there's no learning, there's no surprises, there's no adaptation, this is, this is the way um, it moves. And it has, and still does, underpin um, classical theories of management. This is still uh, the dominant approach, I would say, in most organisations uh, still. 
Um, I then say to managers, um, well, you know, is that the only science then? Here we have this very mechanical science of, of, um, <coughs> of systems. I don't, I don't always talk about thermodynamics and equilibrium thermodynamics, but depending on how long I've got with them, I might then um, express, you know, bring that into the picture as well, but I might just go to this. So I'm saying, well, you know, golly, evolution is a science. I say to people, why is it a science? Well, because we have some kind of understanding of mechanism. We, we, we expect it to be universal, but it's not like... Um, the science of, of closed systems, because you don't actually know quite what is going to evolve. Um, you, you, <coughs> there's, there's some uncertainty in it. I say to people that, as far as I can see, it was the first time in the history of philosophy that messiness um, and diversity were kind of central, that you can't have change without diversity. Um, that, 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 that really... Uh, captured the imagination of people in, in the late 19th century. It affected physics, it affected anthropology, it affected psychology, um, it affected literature. This, this whole idea of path dependency and the role of variation was, was a very powerful kind of new uh, view of, of what science could be. So I explain to people maybe by talking um, about uh, I have an example about, uh, you know, on, on, on Tuesday afternoon at 2.30, down the road from here, a frog was born with longer legs than its brothers and sisters. You know, is that good or bad? And I'm, I'm asking people to think about how something like having longer legs is, is, is it, it, it's only useful if, 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 it, if there's a kind of systemic um, uh, uh, adaptation to that. So we tell the story about how in this particular summer, the, um, uh, the, the weather was wetter than normal, so the reeds grew higher, and the flies um, were hovering at the tops of the reeds, so Fred the frog could, could reach the, um, the, the juicy um, uh, flies. And this became a kind of adaptation for, for the moment that, that worked well on, on that pond. So I'm introducing them to the idea that things emerge when something changes that suits the local conditions. It's not optimal, um, other than it's, 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 it works at that moment in time. And it may or may not, not sustain. It, might, it may develop and grow, depending on the conditions on, on other ponds. Um, if there's a very dry summer the year afterwards, uh, and the flies are lower and there's less food, it's not going to be advantageous to be a bigger frog with longer legs, because you'll need more food, and you're not getting more food because the, the reeds are growing lower. So it may, it may kind of dis disappear again. So I'm introducing people to the idea of, um, in a sense, that, that evolution is, is much more to do with cooperation than, than competition. Um, I, don't think that, I don't think, as I understand it, Darwin ever said the, the thing about red in tooth and claw and you know, the, the survival of the fittest. It was said of him and about evolution, but not, not uh, by him. Um, and this idea of, of, of path dependency, that what happens next builds on what's there, it's shaped by the past but not determined by the past um, and the future cannot be, be known um, in advance, we can't predict exactly what's, uh, what's going to happen, there's, um, there's more than one option. Um, and then finally, um, and, and again remember I'm not talking to scientists like you, um, I'm talking to, to, to managers, um, I'm then introducing uh, complexity theory through the eyes of Ilya Prigogine. Um, Ilya Prigogin in, uh, got the Nobel Prize, as, as you'll know, for, for this work in physical chemistry in 1976. And um, he was, uh, was Russian-born, but worked in Brussels. And um, he says in his autobiography that he was intrigued by reading Bergson on evolution. And this particular quote, which, um, which I don't always use with, with managers, but it's, why does life mount the income that matter descends? So in other words, um, e equilibrium thermodynamics tells us that, that, uh, that things um, dissolve into featureless dust over time. Meanwhile, we, we have this experience of life as becoming more sophisticated, more complex, as, as, as evolving. You know, why, why was that? And he really introduced in, into physics, and of course this is all pre-computers, the fact that for open systems he was able to show that there was a, a lot of experiments going on in Russia in the 1950s, um, which was showing um, how uh, how chemical systems with not in um, with with um, temperature differentials across them were were demonstrating these kind of swirls 
um, that, that were, were vast on molecular scales and were, were different every time. So um, he was interested in this idea of, of new patterns forming that are shaped by, that by the particular clarities of the situation and the past. Um, and this was, I'm asserting, is the, the, the start of the science of complexity. And Peter Allen, who was also a theoretical physicist but, but stayed in it longer than um, I did, uh, worked as a postdoc with, with, um, with Prigogin and worked with him for many years. And then I worked with Peter at, at Cranfield for many years. So there's, that's, there's, there's a sense of that that is the tradition of, of complexity that we've, um, we've grown up in. Um, so that's where I get people. That can take quite a long time with, with, with managers to, to kind of just, just kind of de... I'm trying to kind of destabilise this idea of what is science really? Do we really know? Can we, can we really assume that this mechanical world view can just be plopped into the social and natural world um, as it <coughs> works? And do we understand the difference between a closed system? How could an organisation be a closed system if it were closed? then it has no customers, no suppliers, nobody leaves it. You know, if, 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 if an organisation or an ecology or an economy are open systems, then how does that, how does that change the way we, we need to work with them? Because if we don't take that into account, we may not do a good job. Um, so one question at some point I might ask managers is, you know, who's been involved in, in strategy development? So most of them put their hands up and I say, well, keep your hand up if your strategies go to plan. How often do they go to plan? Everybody puts their hand down. And um, I've asked that question of many, many groups, and, and I think at the most, 20% of people will say, yes, you know, my strategy went to plan. Well, why don't they go to plan? And then we kind of describe all the, the, the unexpected circumstances, the changing context, and it gets people into, well, that's not, a, that's not an argument for not planning, but maybe it's an argument for planning with a different mindset. So that's the, the kind of thing I'm, I'm interested in. Um, this is one um, description, uh, which isn't in the book. I've been, I've been kind of developing the <coughs> way of, of um, putting things across. Um, and I've obviously got stuck on the letter P, so it's, um, it's either useful or, or not, <coughs> I haven't decided. But I'm trying to say then, if you take the mathematical modelling, if you take the work people have done thinking about forests, you know, if you, if you, t if you take a lot of information, <coughs> how can you summarise um, what is, is the complexity worldview? What do I need managers to think about in terms of, of what is a complexity worldview? So this is my version um, of this. And, and the first thing, I guess, is, is about patterning. And, um, and obviously, we, we work on big data in, in, all, in all sorts of ways. People are interested in, in, um, in patterning. And the, the point I'm trying to get to managers is when I say things are complex, I'm not suggesting you need to know everything about everything in order to, to move. Because what, what, what happens over time in many situations is things become relatively stable and they are patterned. So if I go into an organisation, um, I did some lovely work a few years ago in, in, um, in Howder. Um, and uh, I was comparing the culture of this particular organisation with, with their sister company in the northeast of England. And I was looking at, 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 at how do you describe the culture. So the first, the first thing was, was interviewing a lot of people, reading a lot of things, wandering around a lot. But the, the, the point was I could, I could describe reasonably well the, the culture of in Howder compared to in the northeast of England in maybe six words. Now it's not perfect, but in a way I'm capturing patterns. In the same way we can capture demographics, we can we can capture qualities of, you know, the town I live in is is it has has a different vibe, a different ca character to other towns around it. How do I describe that? So it's introducing people to the idea that we, we want to look at and understand patterns. Um, whilst remembering that they may not be there forever, so they're not fixed. We can't assume the future can be defined by the current patterns, but they certainly, it's what, it's what we're building off. So we need to understand them because that's the starting point in, in a sense, but we have to remember that, that they may change, which leads me on to the second point. And a lot of, of uh, political science theories and um, management theories are really based, are predicated on the idea that by and large things are stable and ever so often they change. So it preferences stability over change. So one of, one of the things we talk about it with managers is, is this, this rather ghastly phrase, which I, is, is problematic, that has become quite popular, which you may have heard of, of a VUCA world. 
which stands for volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Um, and it's slightly problematic because the, uh, the, the world, if the world is, is volatile and complex, then our response to it is uncertain and ambiguous, if you see what I mean. So it kind of muddles up um, to if you, ontology and epistemology, if you want to use those words. So it's not, it's not a terrific phrase, but it, it leads you into a conversation with people about, well, are things more volatile than they used to be? Are things more connected? Are things more changing? You know, can, can you rely on, you know, who on earth would have, you know, um, I shall have to be careful if I'm taped it, who on earth would have dreamt up Brexit? You know, it's, um, <laughs> we see that coming. So there's, there's something about um, this, this notion of preferencing the, the idea of change over the idea of stability. So yes, things get locked in and actually sometimes very rigid and tight and we, we wish we could change them. But it's preferencing in people's heads the notion of, do I notice what's changing, is, is a slightly different mindset to, well, things are, things are, things are stable. Um, oh, whoops, you know, they've all changed and our economic models are, are, are no longer working. You know, we, did, we didn't predict you know, 2008 or whatever it is. So, so it's preferencing this idea of, 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 of the world is processual and it occasionally is stable. Third point I talked about, about, about path dependency. And, and again, I'm trying to explain to people, I'm not just saying we can learn from the past, or even particularly saying we can learn from the past. What I'm saying is that the past is, is, is here in the, in the depth and, and the, the nature of the patterning that we're sitting in, so, so that the, the present is shaped by the past, whether we like it or not. It's here. Um, and so do we understand that? And, and it means in terms of, of my approach to consultancy and management, I'll spend a lot of time doing a diagnostic. I, I, I would never dream of going into an organisation and having an idea of what do you do? You know, what are, how am I going to help them? It's really immersing yourself in their context, in their history, you know, in the organisation, talking to many people, um, in order to get some idea of, 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 of what's, what's here and how, how deeply held is it. Fourth point is, is this, this, this paradox in, in a way that, that um, no two situations, organisations, regions are alike. Um, so if, if we get too uh, fixed, um, there's the, the, the UK is, is I, I think, does this particularly more than, well, you, you, may, you may have your, your own examples of this, but there's a sense in which what the UK wants to do is say there is an educational model you know, there is a good way of teaching people and we will roll that out across every, every school and then we'll measure whether people are, are doing it, not just measure the outcomes, but measure the process. We'll tell people how to teach, we'll measure whether they're teaching that way, we'll measure the kids, you know, we'll measure the outcomes. And it's, a, it's, it, 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 it's, it's prefaced by the idea that, that to, be, uh, to be fair or to be uh, professional, you need to do the same thing everywhere. Whereas, um, you know, I sometimes use the analogy with people about families, you know, is, is, is any family like any other family? Is any child like any other child? You know, any, any parents saying, how do I handle this? Do I toughen up here? You know, well, this is this kid, you know, they've had this history, they got really upset at school yesterday, so I'm not going to be so hard on them now. But that kid, you know, this is the, this is the last straw now, you know, they are definitely being grounded. So... That we're used to that. We're used to thinking in that contextual way about, about families. We wouldn't be, you know, if one of our friends came along and said, "This is how to this is how to bring up your children," we would not um, be um, sympathetic to their view. But there's a, there's a sense in which when we get into the world of organisations, who by you know of course are in the same world, then we we have this idea that we have to have a right way that we have to roll out. Even if we pilot it, we then roll it out. So what you know, and, and then people go, oh, well, she's going to tell us absolutely everything we do has got to be completely different every time and we've got to work it all out from the start. So the middle ground of that is, well, no, you don't have to do that, but you have to maybe do some learning, talk to people where things are going well in their organisation, see what you can <coughs> learn from them, but then try it out and see what happens for yourself and be prepared to kind of modify that um, depending on your context and on changing circumstances and then share, share learning. So you get harmony through shared learning rather than harmony through diktat, through, through telling people the best way to do things. So that, that's the kind of um, conversation I'm having. Um, this idea of, of imperfection, you know, that a, that a lot of organisations feel they have to really streamline what they do and, and be, uh, be precisely appropriate for the context of what they're doing. But of course the context of what they're doing 
is constantly changing, both in terms of, of, of the people in it, of the consumers, um, of, of different entrants into their marketplaces. So there's, there's a sense in which you, you have to have some way in an organisation to have some ability to adapt, to, to experiment, to try things out. And if you over-engineer it, if you over-optimise your organisation against the present, you may be less able to respond to a change in the future. So what's the balance there? Um, the, the, the idea of emergence, you know, the, the idea that not all the time, but there, there, is a, uh, there is a possibility that what emerges cannot be known in advance, was not seen. The idea of unknown unknowns, um, that, that sometimes what goes wrong in, in strategy is we assume a kind of a, um, extrapolation of the present into the future, and um, in stable situations that will be great, but are we, are we able to cope with uh, things happening that we couldn't have possibly imagined and I have a number of case studies about organisations that where they, they either did or didn't spot changing trends or things in their organisation that were re working really well that they didn't notice because it was outside of their strategy that kind of thing so that's a really important um, idea as is the idea of episodic change so the idea that, that sometimes things are very stable and then sometimes things change quite fast so what I may or may not, may not explain is that there's a sort of unfreezing going on. There may, be, there may be not much to show for a shift. And then shifts can sometimes happen quite fast and, and be quite radical. Um, it, it matters uh, when you're talking about um, measurement of, of uh, evaluating uh, organisations, working out what's, um, what's been achieved. So to tell you um, a little uh, example there... Um, one of my friends was, was the chief executive of a charity that worked with, uh, with, with dis disability in Africa and Asia. And she, uh, slightly cynically, and probably tongue-in-cheek one, um, one evening over a meal, said to me, we've stopped working in countries that really need us now. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? And she said, well, well, what happens is we go into a country where nobody's done very much about disability. We're, we're starting to um, make some contacts, you know, we're, 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 we're influencing people about maybe changing some processes about the way disabled people are valued and, and dealt with. Um, but when the project ends, there's, there's very little that we can point to that we've done. The next agency goes in, builds on everything we've done, you know, and then has measurable outcomes like numbers of wheelchairs or changes in policy. So then they get they get um, you know they get the credit in, in a sense you know because they they get the concrete measurables. Whereas what we've been doing is building the ground. And she said we can't get the funding, so we've given up. You know, we just go to countries that are already started on the journey, and then we can we can have the wheelchairs to measure and uh, you know the changes in policy. So so there's something very pernicious about a kind of linear model of cause and effect. Um, which will stop you doing important things because um, th th there may be little that's concrete and measurable to show um, at the beginning of, of those kind of changes. And final point is, is this idea of, of, of paradoxical, that, that, that many issues that are really important and challenging in the world um, are, end up being a kind of um, incommensurable tension between opposites. So um, I can talk at, at, at length and some more if later on about, for example, the, the idea of, of, of freedom and, and equality, um, that, that they lead you in very different political models or economic models come to that. So if you take one to extreme, it, it, has, it has consequences that, that don't work. You know, sitting in the middle of that, so how much, what should the role of the state be in, in a political system? You know, should we have a completely de deregulated um, e e economy? You know, where, where is, how do, we, how do we tussle with the tension between these opposites? Or how do we balance the short term and the long term? How do we balance efficiency and agility? That, that most meaty problems that most managers and economists and policy makers are dealing with don't have simple answers. And if somebody comes out with a simple answer, there's probably, there's probably something missing in it. You know? And so, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in this idea of that, that, at, that at the centre of complex problems is, is usually uh, something that, that you have to tussle with, something that, that doesn't provide you with, with an easy plan. You're, mo you're moving between poles, you're kind of trying to find a new kind of answer. So that's my complexity world view that I 
talk to people about, and I'm going to speed up this little bit, um, I'm going to overrun. Um, I, I, this is what Peter Allen would regard as, as the most important contribution he made. He's, he's long retired now, Peter. I, I saw him last week and had a coffee with him, and I'm, I'm going to put together um, a retrospective of, of, of Peter Allen and a couple of other people who were really um, you know, very important people, in, in my view, in the world of, of complexity, and have a kind of get them on stage and, and get them to have a discussion about their contributions and how they really view complexity. So I can let you know about that. That will be happening in the spring in the UK. But, but what, what he's, he's saying is, in, and in a sense, what systems thinking um, is, is talking about, uh, or is, is often talking about, is, is, is the idea of patterns. If we understand the patterns, then we know what to do, then we can kind of move forward. What complex systems thinking in, in this view is, is particularly um, emphasising is the dance, is the relationship between what is and, and what disturbs and destabilises those patterns. So the issues of, of events, charms, actions, variation, shock, shifting alliances, that there's a sort of messiness and a, and a particularity of things going on that may or may not undermine current patterns, that disturb patterns. So that idea of invading patterns. And that the future, the dynamics of this, is both understanding what patterns sustain, but, but both uh, what patterns are being destabilised. Do you notice that dissolving of, of patterns? And do you spot um, emerging new shifts of, of, of new patterns or new things happening? Do you have a sense of what's creating that, that uh, potentially that invasion of patterns? And so a lot of Peter Allen's modelling work was, was really trying to model how, how do you dissolve patterns, you know, how do you invade patterns, um, rather than how do you understand them in the first place. So that's, a, that's a, an important slide, I think, for me, that really summarises um, our, our stance on complexity thinking. Um, so I talk about this idea of the middle ground because for managers, they, what they hear is a sort of psychology. There's a lot of psychology in the way uh, people hear and understand complexity. So I'm, I'm, that they hear me say, telling them the world is like a machine. So they imagine I'm saying the world is just totally random and chaotic or you have to know everything to move. And, and the issue is, is we're in the middle ground. Yes, of course I plan. You know, yes, of course my life goes to plan quite a lot of the time, but sometimes it doesn't. How do I hold plans more lightly? But it doesn't mean I don't plan. You know, it doesn't mean I don't analyse problems. It doesn't mean I don't model problems. I just might hold them more lightly and, and look for signs of emerging change at, at, at the same time. So it's, it's really important, I think, with managers to, to not say, we're not doing this anymore, but to say, you know, we're, we're going to do it in a slightly different way. So I want to just rattle through just um, a number of, of, of approaches and things that I've, I've developed over years, really. This is like a many, many years of work where I go into organisations. I think what I'm saying is fairly clear, and they're sitting there going, either I've no idea what you're talking about or I can't operationalise this. So this, this, this has come out of a, a lot of practice, really. So I've made that point already, which, which you, you know anyway, but I'm really saying if we don't take account of this <coughs> systems and interconnection, we're not going to do as good a job. You know, we're going to be less efficient. Assu assuming that you can operate like a machine, which sounds efficient, isn't efficient if you can't work like a machine. So, so we're, if you to be efficient, to be effective, we're going to have to embrace uh, complexity uh, to a degree. Um, I, I don't always say this, but I've added uh, this in because this, this was quite a, a funny little story. So Peter Allen, who's, you know, not necessarily the kind of person you'd, you'd expect to, to say this or, or wasn't at the time, came back from a meeting in London one day clutching a copy of the Tao Te Ching, which is a book on Taoism, um, going, look at this gene, look at the introduction to the Tao Te Ching. It, it reads exactly like a complexity theory textbook. And I got interested, um, and it, it, it does. It said there's a particular, it's Ames and Hall 2006, if anybody's interested. And it, the, the introduction to it, which is very, it talks about process and, and, and the kind of ontological stance of, of Taoism. And I find it absolutely fascinating. And um, it, it took me on a journey, which is kind of written up partly in, in chapter four of this, 
um, looking at uh, Buddhism and the pre-Socratics and this whole kind of tradition of thinking in the 5th century BC, which interestingly also came as a result of, of chaos and big changes to 5th century BC Bronze Age um, society, um, both in, in the West and, and the East, although they, they, they responded slightly differently. And if, if we had time, you can really kind of look at a number of, of these kind of ideas. And, and they have this kind of underpinning idea of, of flow, but of patterning. And, um, and, and even with the, the Dao De Ching, this, this, this idea of, you know, that when the sw swinging gateway opens, novelty emerges spontaneously, but the door isn't always open. So it has this, this, this idea of episodic change, you know, that, that it isn't like there's a constant opening of the door. You know, there's, there's, there's kind of, there's moments when the, the, the things really seem to change a lot and other times when, when they don't. And of course we get beguiled by periods of, of stability. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. And um, it kind of occurred to me that, that the pre-modern world and the postmodern scientific world, if you can call it that, is it, are, ve are very similar. They've, yeah. they've, you know, we've done all this mathematical modelling and all this sophistication. We've come back to, in a sense, what these guys knew anyway through just living and noticing um, the world around them. And modernism, this, this real sense of, of the separation uh, of science into this very deterministic, rational box, is, it has been, in philosophical terms, a, you know, a, a, a bit of a detour. A, 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 but has huge power in the world, um, and, and it's, it's why I think I see complexity thinking a bit of, as a form of activism, because um, you know we are we are doing a good job of destroying the world at the moment in, in a you know discuss in a variety of ways, and it's, it it can often be to do with thinking we can control the, the future. So, for example, um, climate change for many people is 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 that they have a kind of idea that you know well we have if we have a little bit too much climate change we can kind of pull it back. It's a kind of incremental mindset. So it's okay, you know, it's pretty bad, but we can kind of haul it back. Whereas if you have the idea in your mind of kind of, you know, tipping points and step change, then you would have a different approach to it. So that would, that's one example, perhaps, of, of where modernism um, is, is, is quite dysfunctional um, in, in our world and certainty. So I sometimes use the example of, uh, of, of getting people to, and people love doing this in organisations, you know, do, think back to when you were 16, has your life gone to plan? You know, and I might do this right at the beginning of, of a lecture or, or a session. And people love it, you know, so they tell you all these stories, you know, um, of, of how their life hasn't gone to plan. And then we talk about why hasn't it got, gone to plan. And then later on I come back to this and, that, and kind of say, well, does that sound like a complexity worldview or a mechanical worldview? Um, and, um, you know, it, it's hard not to feel that I'm, that I'm talking about that, that their experience of life, of unintended consequences of the world changing around them, of making decisions for one reason and it taking you somewhere else, isn't more um, in line with a, a complexity worldview. I sometimes do the same thing... Um, uh, with uh, talking about a wave, I have a picture of a, of a wave, and I say, "What's made that wave the shape it is?" And and I'm hoping people will talk about, you know, the moon and, and the sand and, and the, the rake of, of the um, shore. But but also, and they they tend not to do this. But also, I'm kind of saying, "Well, yes, but there was a tsunami two days ago, you know, and that's affected this wave here, and a, a, a whale just surfaced." Five minutes ago, you know, so I, it, it's it's a good way of getting people to think about about that kind of complexity. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I've talked a little bit about um, incommensurability um, and paradox, and I think this is really important. You know, of all the things I do, just to get people to say it's it's not that we can know nothing. It's it's just that 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 many complex problems aren't amenable. And just to rational thinking, or just to uh, to, to analysis, we're we're kind of struggling with these. Um, I mean, it's been really interesting uh, to. Um, I I've been a member of, of um, a town council, which is the only independent town council, or was the only independent town council. It's had an independent set of councillors, so i.e. they're not they're not. They they work together, but they're not representing any particular parties. They're trying to do their best. It, it, it has a different kind of vibe to it to have, have a group of independents. And there's a, there's a strong focus on participation. And for some people, there's a kind of feeling that if we just participate, 
and kind of surface, you know, if we just kind of discuss things, that the, the rational outcome will, will happen. You know, we'll talk to each other and then what will, what will, because it's rational, then we'll come out with an answer. Whereas, of course, it's, it's not like that. Sometimes it's about participation. Sometimes it's about, it's about expertise or leadership. Uh, or, um, you know, about there not being a right answer because some people feel, you know, that climate change is, is what we should be really focusing on. Other people think it's about social inequality. Other people think we should be enhancing businesses. So, it, it, again, if you don't, if, you, if you're not careful, people come, love it to come up with, the only thing we need to do here is to really make sure we participate and then kind of good will come or clarity will come. So I'm, I'm really interested in holding people in this uncomfortable place of, well, that's true, but what about the opposite? How do we, how do we weave? How do we, how do we notice the tension? When is it right to do a bit more of this? When is it right to do a bit more of that? So that's, that's kind of um, an important point. This is an important point for organisations that, that really works, because by now they're all going, oh, gosh, you know, this is really terribly complicated. I don't know what to do anymore. So I use an example like this with people, which is, um, take something that's, that's a budgeting <coughs> process or a, a strategic planning process or a performance management process. You know, what, what underpins the thinking behind performance management and get people to, in a sense, express, you know, well, we assume that you tell me what to do and I have, I have understood what you said, I want to do it, I'm capable of doing it, you know, you, we, we assume you can measure what I've done all those sorts of things, it is kind of predicated on a kind of mechanical world view. And I say to them, well, you can't change that system, but how could you use it differently with complexity in mind? And they will come out with things like, well, we can have shared objectives, we can review them more often, you know, we can change some of them later on in the year, etc. We can have different people addressing whether those um, objectives have, have been achieved. So that they relax then, it, it sort of doesn't feel too difficult, you know, you, you, can, you can use existing methods with complexity in mind and you're just mediating them um, to some extent. Um, another thing that uh, I have, I'm going to stop in five minutes if that's okay, um, another thing that I've been, this is kind of new, um, the way I'm describing this is, is slightly new, which is is about how do you then go about engendering systemic change, uh, whether it's in your organisation or whether it's 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 broader in, in society. You know, how do how do how what does this tell you about the way to approach change? And um, this diagram, uh, um, and I'm you may need to ask me questions because I'm going to run out of time if I talk about this too much. But this this is I say to people, this is the inside of my head. This is how I approach um, every problem. So I'm, I'm interested in terms of understanding the context of really understanding the past, both in terms of its patterns and were there any critical junctures, were there any particular important things that happened or important people, um, and, and looking at the present and looking at the future. So to give you very quickly an, um, an example of this, um, I did some work uh, around uh, the issue of, of Syria, uh, before and, and the, the, the the question was in in a way why didn't why didn't the, um, sorry I'm not saying this very clearly let's start again the, Syria was 42nd I think it was on on a, a, a measure of fragile states but it was not regarded as fragile at all before it, it collapsed in 2011-12 um, why is that well because it had uh, um, concrete measures of things that work. So it had universities, it had roads, it had industry, it hadn't had particular um, ethnic conflicts going on. It, it had all the measures of stability. Um, and the issue is that, that with, with the kind of measures of fragile states, they, they are current measures. It doesn't, they don't have a dynamic mindset. Now if you looked at the history of, of Syria, there were, then there were um, a range of, of things going on. And I I apologise to the tape if I'm getting some of this um, slightly uh, misremembered, but there was a drought which meant that uh, uh, people from the southeast of, of Syria were starting to move towards the, the cities. Um, Assad the Elder 
had had a lot of social policy, social safety nets. So when, when there were things like droughts, then people were kind of protected and supported. But the kind of neoliberal view of Assad the, the Younger meant that those kind of safety nets had gone. <coughs> so there was, no, there was no safety net. So that was a political issue going on. There were no safety nets. There was an environmental issue going on. People were moving uh, to the towns, and that was threatening uh, for people. Um, so that th those oh, and that th there was starting to be less oil. So there was a kind of economic reason why why, why things were, were less um, stable. So if you look systemically at that, if you put the, the the political, economic, environmental, and social together, and start looking at that as a dynamic, you start to think, oh, you know, something is changing here. So why don't we measure stability, fragility in a dynamic way, which would you know might come from come up. From complexity mindset. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking at. Um, in the story in Unilever was was uh, that that Polman, the new chief executive, when when he went there, he spent quite a lot of time, several months, wandering around, getting the hang of what was there, not not just assuming in in a sense he had the right answer and he could come in and, and change the organisation. And one of the interesting things about Unilever, and I've certainly prodded this when I've been there, is, is to do with, they, they have very strong values about sustainability. And my interest was, well, is this kind of greenwash? You know, is this what people say? Or is it, does, is, has it got some depth with it? It's been there since the beginning of Unilever. When you prod it, when you talk to people and look at what they do, they re it really is a deep, deeply held value. It, it is a pattern that's sustained. So it's good to know that, it's useful to know that when you're starting to, to work there. Similarly, I'm trying to, do, to say to people, um, as well as really thinking about the future, um, and, and quite often um, there's, a, there's a lot of perfectly concrete, rational, quantitative things going on in the future that you need to, to look at. So I did another piece of work around the Yemen, um, which I won't bore you with, but it, it, it was very clear when you looked at various things like, you know, the population is growing so fast, half the population are under 15, you know, one of the highest growth rates in, in, the, in the world, increasing drought, um, increasing um, problems with how Saudi Arabia was viewing uh, the Yemen, you know, the oil that they had was running out in 2017-18, you know, it was, it was not surprising that things got much, much worse at that moment in time because there were so many factors coming together. Now, it's perfectly concrete and rational, it's not, it's not zen. Um, but, but do we do enough of, of having this mindset which says we need to look at the um, dynamic? And the other thing, as well as, as, as foresighting, or thinking about the future, is also about do you notice what's changing? Do, you actually, do, we, do we actually have people in organisations who really see that is a, a big part of their job is wandering around? Uh, they used to call it management by wandering around. Um, and do we do enough of seeing what's going on in the organisation? And are we networked enough to really spot shifting trends and new things going on in the wider world so we can feed that back in? So this kind of dynamical systems mapping um, is, is really, really important. And the bit of that, people like futures work, so they, they can kind of cope with that. They don't seem to, it, it still seems quite alien to people to, to really say, you've got to notice what's changing, even if it's qualitative, even if you're not sure. How do you actually work with people in a kind of critically subjective way to actually start saying, there are some things that are new and different here. Do you ever ask your workers on the ground, your sessional workers in, in international development, do they notice anything new and different happening? Does anybody ever ask them? Or do they just get asked to fill in forms about, about the, the measurements of the outcomes that have been uh, pre-agreed? So it's an important practice actually looking for change. And it's also a very important practice to actually understand where you're starting from, understanding that, that kind of um, uh, the landscape from the past. So they, they've been important things to look at. Um, and the other thing that I uh, talk about is we have to decide whether our job as a change agent here in this situation is about strengthening the system or invading the system. Are we trying to stabilise things or are we trying to break things? Or are we trying to grow things um, alongside? And um, th this kind of idea of the life cycle of a forest, and I'm not, I'm not saying social systems are, are so kind of um, organised, but you know, if I'm doing a work in, in, in a situation that's very locked in and rigid, maybe my job is to try and break it, you know, to, to break, break open um, that rigidity. 
if I'm working in a situation that's very loose and chaotic, maybe my job is to, is to kind of help to cohere things together. So there's a sort of contingent approach to, um, to change that I think is really important to think through because I hear people with systemic change feeling like all you have to do is get everybody together and, and, and kind of discuss things and, and then the job is done. And it's, it's, it's a contingent um, issue. Um, similarly, contingency in uh, strategies. I was, I was teaching this last week in, in Cranfield. So we have to understand something about the nature of the environment um, to really decide what kind of strategic response we have. And it often goes wrong if we assume we know more about the future than we do. If we think we've predicted the market and we get it wrong, then that's not going to be very helpful. You know, do we, do we, um, do we have, you know, there's, there's talk, discussion about things like minimal viable product. You know, we, if we're doing something disruptive, let's do it rough enough that we can test it out and see if it works. Um, so that's... That's the kind of way, and I may have, as I said, a number of case studies that underpin that. Final slide then. Um, I would, with, with certain groups and in certain situations, try and, and really raise this, this issue of, uh, of values and, and intentions. So what I'm arguing here, and um, this is how I view it, you, you may view it differently, that in, in some sense, if, if the future is... is is un unknowable to a degree, is not entirely pr predictable, then the thing I have control over is, is in a sense, my next step, is what, I, what ingredients I'm putting into the system now. Um, so if I, if I lie, um, the, 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 or if, if I distort the, the truth because I have a particular intention in mind, then the only thing I know is like, that the, the, the untruth, in a sense, is, is in the system. And there's, there's been examples in UK politics, uh, which I won't, I won't mention on tape necessarily, where, where there was a distortion of, of the truth, which took us into war. And, um, and, and in a sense, you know, the war is in the system. And the fact that that person <laughs> told an untruth is never forgotten. They're in the system. Um, and that's, so, so do we understand our practice is, is about, about the steps that we're taking, having an intention, working with others about an intention, but, but, but understanding the authenticity and the quality of, of the steps that, that we're taking. Uh, and, and you can hear that is quite a kind of Buddhist, Taoist uh, view uh, as well. Um, so I'm kind of interested in that. And one of the examples I gave as my, my last uh, comment was, and, and I've spent uh, some a few months earlier this year in, in South Africa, and it's it's very noticeable when people talk about Nelson Mandela, uh, black, white, or, or, or um, uh, mixed race, or, or whatever. Everybody tears up about Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela held his integrity for 22 years in in a single prison cell on Robben Island. You know, some of you probably been there. It's very it's very moving, and apparently they had to change the guards every two years because because the guards kind of went native you know the, the, the guards were kind of going to be big and tough with him but he moved people and how do you hold your integrity for 22 years you know he has no reason to expect to ever get out or to ever be in any position of, of, of influence ever again but because because of who he was and how he held that integrity then he becomes the right person to lead the, the country out of apartheid and, and to um, and, and to become president, and it's not to say that you know there are all sorts of issues. It's not it's not a kind of fixed uh, situation, but it's it's an interesting example about where really paying attention to your values and behaviours, as opposed to being Machiavellian or, or or strategic or political about well I'll just say this here because I'm trying to move this over there. It's a kind of interesting dilemma, and I get that, as I say you don't have to agree with me because I I think science is neutral. Um, it, it's um, if, if you do whatever you do, it's in the system, um, and you you have to make your own mind up about how you want to behave. But I think it's an interesting way to think about it. So, um, so that's it really. Um, I, I think that, that the big issue for me with 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 managers and leaders is 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 about trying to find ways to access this these ideas as as um, a, a, a changing mindset, um, and then. If there is modelling to be to be had to be useful, which of course there is, they they will see that in the right way, that as as opposed to they won't see it necessarily as, as the, the, the the truth. Um, I think it's it's a complexity worldview in part changes methods, but in particular changes how you use existing methods. 
and what certainty you place on plans, models and predictions. And it also um, pushes you more into noticing what is as well as thinking, you know, that, that, that behaviour isn't always about deciding what to do, it's, it's about noticing what is, uh, what is happening. So thank you very much, I hope that's been um, of interest, I'm sorry to overrun a little bit, and thank you for your attention.